state of Texas by the Silver Rio Grande Strolled a couple out one evening, was two sweethearts hand in hand Was rich man's pretty daughter and the lad's That night, the incessant bombardment was halted and the exhausted defenders fell into a deep sleep. A few pickets were posted outside the walls, but they too slept and were quietly killed before they could sound an alarm. Assault columns, one from each direction, crept into place during the middle of the night. And it was very cold. A norther had blown in. They lay silently on the cold ground for hours. Santana stood with the reserve unit and the band to the north. His lancers, about 500 strong, were stationed around the perimeter with orders to ride down escaping Texans and retreating Mexicans. The Mexicans had scaling ladders as well as a few crowbars and axes, but the walls were low only nine or 10 feet, here and there as much as 12 feet. The roofs were flat, there were no loopholes. So the defenders had to raise up to fire, exposing their heads and upper bodies as they raised up. Out at Mission San Jose, the flat roof perimeter apartments have been reconstructed there. You can get a pretty good idea of the low Alamo walls without loopholes or embrasures. Before dawn, about 5 a.m., a soldado could wait no longer. Viva Santana! And this shout was taken up throughout the ranks, so much for surprise. An artillery signal was fired, and the bland band blared out the Deguello. Inside the Alamo, Travis's adjutant raced to the Commandant's headquarters, arousing both Travis and his slave Joe. Joe, age 23, had fought alongside Travis, and now both men leaped from their cots with their weapons. As Travis ran to his post on the north wall, he shouted, The Mexicans are on us! Give them hell, boys! And then in Spanish, no rendirse, muchachos. Don't surrender, boys. Travis was one of the first to die. He raised up over the north wall, fired his double-barrel shotgun into the Mexicans, and then he was struck by a ball in the forehead. Joe then ran into one of the buildings. He later was spared by the Mexicans, who had had all they wanted of slavery from uh, the Spanish. Joe, therefore, was the only combatant to, su to survive. The Texas cannons, firing grape shot, took a toll of the advancing columns, and so did the riflemen. Now, they were firing single-shot muzzle loaders, and that took about a minute to reload those things with the ramrod in and out a couple of times, a uh, uh, measured amount of powder, ramrod, uh, uh, a ball in a linen patch, ramrod, splash the fire pan, fire. Took about a minute. But the thing was, American frontiersmen were unusually good, unusually rapid at reloading those things. So it wasn't just the marksmanship, it was the arms handling by these frontiersmen. As courageous as the Alamo defenders were, the Mexican soldados also displayed valor, the highest order, charging again and again despite terrible casualties. But by now, a number of defenders had been shot off the walls. Santana committed his reserves for a third charge. This time, east and west columns swerved and they joined the north column at the battered north wall and this sudden convergence overwhelmed the remaining defenders along that 160 foot north wall. With Mexican soldiers now, let me use Joe's phrase, pouring like sheep into the compound behind them, the defenders retreated into the long barracks and other rooms that had been sandbagged for defense. The gun crew on the southwest corner turned their 18 pounder toward the Mexicans flooding into the compound from the north. A round of grape shot staggered the soldados, and so did a second round. But there would not be a third. The gunners were exposed, and they were felled by a Mexican volley. The 18-pounder and other captured Texas cannons were turned by the Mexicans against the long barracks, and the doorway defenses were blasted away by their own cannons. Captain Dickinson ran into the stone church, where the non-combatants had taken refuge, and he found his wife and daughter. Great God, Sue! The Mexicans are inside our walls. All is lost. If they spare you, save our child. Then, she reminisced, with a parting kiss, he drew his sword and plunged into the strife, and she never saw him again. There was vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting on the walls and in the open. The soldados had fixed bayonets, but the Texans fought back with rifle butts, bowie knives, tomahawks. By now, the Mexicans, having seen their comrades shot down in horrendous numbers, were filled with bloodlust. When the soldados broke into the church, artilleryman Joseph Walker, who had a wife and four children in Nacogdoches, he was shot down in front of Susanna Dickinson. 
She said, I saw four Mexicans toss him up in the air with their bayonets and then shoot him. Bowie was slain in his sick bed. At least two groups of Texans tried to escape to the east, but the Lancers rode them down, caught in the open. They soon were killed. All of the fighting was over by 6.30 after 90 minutes of ferocious combat. When Santana entered the body-strewn compound, five prisoners were brought to him. No quarter, he had said, that the Guayo, Santana ordered them executed on the spot. There is evidence that one of these prisoners was Davy Crockett, but at least three Mexican officers reported differently. One said Quackett, he was the last man slain, and he fought like an infuriated lion. His last stand was a, in a small room. He used his gun as a club until the shot broke his right arm. Drawing a large knife with his left hand, he killed several before he was finally slain. There's a similar account from an officer about Quacky. Enrique Esparza, who was a boy, he was a Tejano boy. His father, Gregorio Esparza, got killed almost in front of his eyes. And he later recounted, Crockett was everywhere during the siege, personally slew many of the enemy with his rifle, his pistol, his knife. He fought hand to hand. He clubbed his rifle when they closed in on him and knocked them down with his stock until he was overwhelmed by numbers and slain. He fought to his last breath. When he died, there was a heap of slain Mexicans in front and on each side of him. And Joe, Travis's slave, testified that Crockett and a few of his friends were found together with 24 of the enemy dead uh, around them, and in an, another account, he said 21. Santana ordered the Texas bodies to be burned. During the rest of the day, wood was cut. These funeral pyres were outside the walls, and they started with a layer of bodies, a layer of wood. Layer of bodies, layer of wood, as high as they could be stacked. These pyres burned and smoldered for days. You can imagine the stench. The ashes, reputedly, were later gathered and placed in an urn, then deposited in San Fernando Cathedral. You can see that urn when you walk into the entrance, just look to the left. There were too many Mexican bodies to bury in the cemeterio, although officers and a few others were interred. But hundreds of soldado bodies were dumped into the San Antonio River. There were so many that they piled up at twists and turns of the river. Soldados were ordered to break up the congestions of now bloated bodies. The bodies floated down river again, then began to pile up again, where they became carrion from buzzards and wolves. The river was polluted for the best part of a year. How many Mexicans were casualties? Between 600 and 1,000, probably is a good estimate of killed and wounded. After the battle, though, a number of wounded died because medical care during that period was woefully inadequate.